Welcome to the iconic Hoover Dam, one of the greatest engineering marvels in the world. Join us as we explore the history, design, and breathtaking views of the monumental structure that has dammed the muddy Colorado River for nearly a century. Here is the visitor's parking area, not as the carports designed to shield vehicles from the intense desert sun. The massive bridge in the distance designed to bypass the dam. It built in 2010. From this panoramic view, you can truly appreciate the scale of the Hoover Dam. Stretching across the Black Canyon, this concrete bigamot has been holding back the Colorado River for over 80 years, creating a massive lake meet behind it. This is a dam spillway, the essential safety feature. With the water in the, in the reservoir ever rise too high, the spillways help to redirect excess around the dam, preventing overflow and ensuring that the structure remains intact. You can see Hoover Dam Towers with their clocks, one with Arizona time and other one with Nevada time. Down below lies the powerhouse where the massive turbines convert the power of Colorado River into electricity. Right here we're standing on the official state line between Nevada and Arizona. These sculptures were designed by Oscar G.W. Hansen. And this is Nevada time clock on the other side of the dam. It's really hot in the desert. Thankfully, these are cooling stations to keep visitors hydrated and safe. We are moving down to the visitor center. <coughs> now we will see the movie about her or them. Thank you. 
Before the first shovel of earth could be removed, the Colorado River had to be diverted from its timeless path. The key was to cut two tunnels through the canyon walls on each side of the river, each 56 feet in diameter and approximately 4,000 feet long, before tunnels took two years to complete. With the tunnels open and copper dams in place, the Colorado River had no choice but to leave its riverbed and flow through the man-made corridors. With the river diverted, steam shovels dug through as much as 135 feet of silt, mud, and gravel to reach bedrock. And there, Hoover Dam began as a simple square wooden form filled with concrete, followed by more than 3 million cubic yards of concrete over the next two years. Add the adjoining structures, and enough concrete was placed to build a four-foot-wide sidewalk around the Earth's equator. Heat from the setting concrete was predicted to take more than 100 years to cool, but engineers fashioned one-inch steel pipe inside each concrete block before it was poured. A refrigeration plant so massive it could produce a thousand ton iceberg every day continuously pumped cold water through the pipes, cooling the concrete so construction was never interrupted. This innovative idea helped the entire structure be completed in just five years, two years ahead of schedule. Hoover Dam was built with five million barrels of cement, 18 million pounds of structural steel, 21 million pounds of gates and valves, and 840 miles of pipe. The scale of some of the equipment was beyond the capacity of American highways and railroads. The pipes that would carry water from the reservoir to the generators were so large they could not be shipped, so a manufacturing plant was created to build them at the site. An infrastructure of highways, railroad tracks, and power lines had to be created to move men and materials from outlying areas to the dam site and to supply electricity for construction. An entire town was needed to house the workers who were pouring in from all over America in the midst of the Great Depression. The project averaged 3,500 workers a day, working three shifts, seven days a week with only two days off a year. The pay scale started at $4 a day, a good wage in the midst of the Great Depression sweeping America. Amid the country's economic uncertainty, the workers in this canyon gave new life to the nation's spirit as they gave new life to the desert southwest. This is an engineering victory of the first order. Another great achievement of American resourcefulness, American skill, and American determination. And that is why I have the right once more to congratulate you who have builded Boulder Dam. And on behalf of the nation, to say to you, well done. Franklin Delano Roosevelt dedicated Boulder Dam on September 30th, 1935. In 1947, Congress officially named it Hoover Dam. Some call it the most prodigious engineering construction feat since the Great Pyramids of Egypt. When a U.S. Senate committee endorsed construction of Hoover Dam in 1928, its report said a mighty river, now a source of destruction, is to be curbed and put to work in the interests of society. And so it was. Hoover Dam brought the desert flood control, a reliable supply of water, electrical power, and more. Behind a 726-foot-tall concrete face lies Lake Mead, America's largest man-made lake. Born of the collected waters of the Colorado River, it could cover the entire state of Pennsylvania to the depth of one foot. But held behind Hoover Dam, it is a life-giving source for communities throughout the Southwest. On its way to meet downstream needs, thousands of gallons of water per second 
flow from Lake Mead to the dam's 17 giant turbines, producing clean, non-polluting hydroelectric power. Hoover Dam produces almost 4.5 billion kilowatt hours of electricity each year, enough to serve the needs of over 1 million people. The sale of this power has repaid the entire cost of constructing Hoover Dam and continues to fund the yearly operating and maintenance costs as well. Hoover Dam helped ensure a future for the communities that settled along the river in the low, flat valleys of Southern California and Southwest Arizona. In Las Vegas, Phoenix, Los Angeles, and other smaller cities, Colorado River water delivered from Lake Mead helps meet the needs of millions of people a year. Hoover Dam and other dams along the Colorado River contain the floodwaters spawned each spring by melting snows. And from their reservoirs flows an assured and reliable water supply for water users throughout the basin. Combined with the warm climate and rich soils of the lower Colorado River Basin, water from Lake Mead has created some of the most productive farmland in the country. Farms in Arizona, Southern California, and Mexico, irrigated by these controlled flows, produce over a billion dollars worth of vegetables and fruits throughout the year for dinner tables across the nation. Clear reservoirs and controlled river stretches resulting from construction of Hoover and other dams have created year-round recreational opportunities at the National Park Service's Lake Mead Recreation Area and other locations along the Colorado River. Hoover Dam first helped create and now helps sustain the high quality of life enjoyed by millions of people in the desert southwest. Hoover Dam and its other projects throughout the West, the Bureau of Reclamation is focused on efficient, effective, environmentally sensitive water resources management to help ensure our limited water supplies can meet the needs of all who depend on them. Wherever the system delivers water, life flourishes. Tickets out because you're going to give them to your twerk. Okay. All right, good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. So, welcome to the elevator. My name is Catherine and I'm going to be your power plant tour guide. So, right now we're going to go down 537 feet into the canyon. That's about the equivalent of a 54 story building. We're traveling six miles an hour, it takes 70 seconds. So as we start to go down, you're probably gonna feel some pressure in your ears, which is normal. So go ahead and yawn or tug on your ears. So when we get down there, the first stop, I'm gonna take you inside of a diversion tunnel, explain a few things about the dam, how they built it, how it works. We're gonna come back to the elevator, then I'm gonna take you to the power plant. When I'm done speaking to you in there, I will make that announcement. Those of you with the wristbands on, you're gonna go without them for the rest of your tour, okay? Just make sure you stay together with friends and family. There's an elevator behind us with the rest of your group. They're just doing the power plant portion. So we take two elevators. I always want to keep you together, but if you do get separated, don't worry. Elevators go to the same place. But stay with myself or Adam. No wandering around the tunnels on your own, okay? We are a working power plant at a federal facility. As far as pictures, we do not have a policy, which means take as many damn pictures as you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's three 
are here, okay? Watch your step, and you're going to follow me out to the right. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah.
and that is up to 96,000 gallons of water per second flowing through the pipe. That would be enough water to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool in less than seven seconds. Wow. Then the water flows down into smaller 13-foot diameter pipes. It leads to the generators spinning the turbines, and then it flows back down the river. Last thing I'm going to tell you about are the spillways. They're on either side of the dam. One on the Arizona side, and of course, one on the Nevada side. And they were built to keep floodwaters from going over the top of the dam. And we've used them twice. Once in 1941 for testing. So when they first filled up the lake, they overfilled it on purpose. And thank goodness they worked. Because in 1983, we did have a flood. There was a heavy snow melt up in the Rocky Mountains. That's where all our water comes from. And all the conditions were just right that year. So here's a picture from the flood of 83. This is the dam right back there. The water ended up cresting within seven feet from the top of the dam. That is way too close. When this flood was occurring, water was going over the spillways for 63 days in a row. And that's about the equivalent of two Niagara Falls. So the water goes into the spillways the tunnels around the dam and then safely back into the river. All right, the next stop on our tour is going to be the Nevada Wing of the Power Plant. Once again, we're going to take two elevators, so please make sure you're staying with friends and family. I'm going to go out first and you guys are going to follow me really, really quick before we go. I know you're not really feeling the floor vibrating or moving too much. There's not a whole lot of water in the pipe right now because there's not a lot of generators running which is normal. They usually don't start turning on the generators about four, five, six o'clock in the evening. That's when people are coming home from work, turning on their air conditioning, their appliances. Sometimes when you're standing in here though, you definitely can feel it. If you're standing in here, when they turn on a generator that that pipe feeds, it actually feels like an earthquake. It's really, really loud. You don't know what it is, it can be kind of scary. But like I said, we're gonna find out how many generators are running in just a minute, okay? Everyone's good? All right guys, follow me. Here's an example of what the sound inside a generator room. We're going to walk through the inspection tunnels inside the center of the Hoover Dam. Elevator on coach would take 20, so over 30 would just wouldn't be any fun. 
Eric's gonna help us get up there. So I grab half, he grabs half. It's about a 200 turnaround. Now when you get up there to go down the tunnel, just remember it's just under a six foot opening. It's round and smooth. So if you're taller, you're gonna watch your head. Um, look for trip hazards as you're going down. The best way to get down the tunnel is pretend you're going down on your right. So when you turn around, come back past each other on the other right. You'll figure out what I'm hitting when you get there. It's kind of tight squeeze. So if you guys are ready, come on in. We're going to 6.6 billion one. Talk to you guys right here for a minute. It's kind of spread out on both sides. You guys can hear me. I moved this down for the next room so you guys can hear me better. Um, so we're in the middle of the dam, pretty much. Um, we're walking upriver this way. Dams are uh, the lakes up that side. Um, um, one of the most common questions we actually get is how many people died during the construction of Hoover Dam. Now, so here's you guys will look at me. Um, officially, the number was 96 industrial accidents on site during the construction project. Um, Industrial accidents. Six, seven, six companies had some rules. One of them was for family members who petitioned for the loss of work or someone passed away, had to be killed on the job, by the job, by an industrial accident. Normal stuff. Blown up, run over, but a lot of things were either guys falling, things falling, guys, but on the job stuff. Now, say I got ran over by a truck, they took me up to Boulder City to heal up, and I didn't make it. Right off the bat, six companies said, I didn't die on the job, your family can't even petition for death benefits. But just that area, it was way back when before just about anything safety rise. So, a lot of deaths, heat related, it's hot out here. Documented temperatures in the tunnels in the summertime on the project, high is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we got up in the summer uh, about 5 p.m. The cap of my truck last Saturday was 165 degrees, just to give you an idea. Rough environment, so a lot of men were dying due to that heat stroke and heat exhaustion. We also had the problem with carbon monoxide poisoning, pretty rampant through the project. Lucky workers at least got home at the end of their shift and were able to kiss their family members goodnight if they had to be here before they passed away in their sleep. All those deaths were automatically signed off by the company doctors as pneumonia, which is a natural occurring death, no chance for death benefits whatsoever. Why they did it, we have no idea. They speculate, don't say Adam said. Um, my personal thoughts are human beings were about the only thing that didn't cost anything during the Depression. There was guys making a million dollars up on Wall Street when they lost their jobs. They were hitchhiking to get out here to get in line with the rest of us just so they could feed their families. And personally, I think the project probably just took advantage of that at the time. The pay was great. If you could get here, if you can keep your job and survive it, it did really well. But it was a rough environment, and remember, this is way before safety regulations, so this is one of the things at the time. Now, they were able to over-engineer the dam by 70%. Doing that brought the dam itself up to an 8.6 on a Richter scale, so we're in rock and roll. We're really comfortable with the way the dam was designed and where it was placed to the earthquake activity. Nevada's third in the country behind Alaska and California for earthquakes, but ours are generally small. A two throughout the year is kind of a big one. The largest earthquake on the site was back in the 50s. It was a 5.2. And at least from what I've read, they couldn't find any detectable damage to the dam or the power plant from the earthquake. Uh, engineering talks about the cracks in the floors and balcony where it just came from. That came from the same time. Speculate, since that's about the only solid piece of concrete from the canyon wall to canyon wall, you got the hug, that's what cracked the floors. But in general, the dam itself, even though it has probably billions of cracks in it, it's the nature of the beast, that's what concrete does. Um, so that's okay, they were used to that. The design they did, the dam itself is not one giant piece of concrete, it's thousands of individual loose blocks, so it can actually shift and move with earthquakes a little bit without getting a ton of damage like one big giant piece of concrete. So it's a really neat system. They spent a lot of time and effort to protect the folks down the river. The byproduct, given this epic hole in the ground behind us, Lake Mead, allows us to store a lot of water. Great for years of drought. The second reason the dam was put in. Plenty of times there's hardly any water coming down the river for years and years, and on the flip side, too much snow, too much flooding going on. So putting the dam there allows us to do that. In a nutshell, best way to explain it, anytime we have any above average snowpack on that west side of the Rockies, that's what we store up and down the river system. And that allows us to do what we do even today. Colorado is only intended for drinking irrigation water, that's what it's supposed to be used for. Um, and then they also cut the river from going off in the ocean, which was that big game changer too. So anything left over, we're going to keep it in the system. The lake was full in 2000, just didn't get all those spillways in the past 24 years. A lot of less than average snowpack because it's just saved all the leftover water. We service nearly 60 million people every day with their drinking irrigation water. 30% of the produce in the entire country comes from our water, uh, mainly Imperial Valley, Southern California, and 70% of the nation's entire winter crops. Same place, same water. And the only way we were able to do that was we kind of got smart and we stopped wasting our water in the ocean. I don't understand. If you've got a river going in the ocean, all your lake should be absolutely full and it'll just got no more space under it unless you run drought and then you got that water for backup. So the system works really good. We're very proud of it. So with that, let's head on down. We'll get you elevated to level four guys.
about halfway, about 250 feet. We're roughly 500 feet from the top. When you get up there and the door's open, um, you're gonna come to your right and your immediate right. You can see the tunnel, head on down. As I said, pretend you're going on your right, uh, back on the other right. You're gonna notice where we're going right now. Um, besides that tunnel we just came from, we only have those two main single levels. The rest of the dam's inside's not finished. The reason they did that was there was actually no intention to do tours inside the dam. They just didn't think it was cool enough. But when we finally had to give up the old hard hat tour in 95, we wanted to show you guys more stuff, so that's why they opened up the dam tour. And muggy. <laughs> This is fine, definitely be on your phones. Excavation and blasting, if you would. So, they uh, built wooden forms where the concrete set, they had to get the materials out. That was one way to get it out. Um, then they also had to finish the dam. I mentioned the blocks. Because they were casting the blocks, if you look at the dam straight on, especially on the riverside, they, we call them the columns. So, they're kind of glued on top of each other this way, but the columns themselves aren't attached whatsoever. So, they, they wouldn't have held water, so they had to backfill. So, at the very beginning, all the tunnel networks were turned routing galleries. Our gallery, our topic, routing was the topic at the time. They actually brought big giant pumps up and hoses and they backfilled the dam so it would hold water. Once the dam was basically a dam with holding water, the tunnels were returned inspection galleries. So not the only reason anybody would be in here and not so much anymore because it's, it's already here. Just check out the kitchen of the concrete from the inside. So like the grade you guys walked over there, that one goes down, it's either 80 or 100 and vice versa that way, this little dog leg. It would just get workers down there at the beginning just to see how the concrete was doing its thing and all that to make sure they weren't having any issues. Once they filled the lake in 41 though, the dam was already ready to go. It's just gonna to continue to get harder and stronger for ever almost. Um, estimated lifespans in the dam of the power plant are different from each other. Power plant's kind of more like a big giant concrete building. It has a ton of structural steel in it. It needs it for the bridge cranes and the load. Dam on the other side, so it's basically just a door stop, plug in the wall. Almost no structural steel in the dam. All the blocks are individual and loose. Some of them are tied together because like the elevators and our staircases, but in general, that's what allows the ship to move. So if you got one big train, like you've seen all the bad movies, virtually impossible for that here. Um, we're talking movies. Um, one of the films, this is just gossip from kind of more of the above. We're very film friendly. We want everyone to come spend their money here because it helps us stay off the tax on it. You know. But there was one film, from what I understand, it was actually forbidden from filming here, which was a fairly recent one, which was San Andreas. When they showed up and they kind of produced or said what they wanted to do here, showing the script and everything else, the horror of what that movie portrayed, what would happen to the dam, we did not want our name on it, just basically because it was so bad. And people are crazy. We get phone calls to our guy desk asking if they can come down and visit the dam, have they got up in back weather since it blew up in that movie. I mean, it makes no sense, but we still do that. I mean, it's kind of weird. So we, we don't want anyone to be afraid. I mean, this is our shining star in the country, what we did back there during the Depression. We want everyone to feel comfortable being here. So silly movies like that, we don't recommend people seeing. Um, so, other things out here, the, which just kind of recently found out, can't learn everything. Um, I didn't realize that concrete has dust here produces very low levels of CO2. Um, we say, I've been saying for 87 years, um, they are moving through helps with the curing process of the concrete, which it does, but the curing is going to take a long time. I think it was more of actually just allowed that little bit of CO2 that the concrete is curing to vent out, so anyone here just didn't get messed up with it. So, that's probably the other ones. 
Um, during construction, elevators and the staircases were used, but they were more dedicated to like the bosses and the visitors. The workers were pretty much on the scaffolding coming in and out of the tunnels generally, so that's why they did that. Hi guys, welcome back. So, I, I mentioned earthquakes. Earthquakes are a big thing around here. Um, not a big deal for us. We're very happy with where they built it, the dam itself. Now, but if we do get earthquakes, we have sensors set out around the place for just in case. Anytime a sensor picks up anything above a 4.0, it'll send a signal down to our control room. <clears throat> go, oh man, we had an earthquake. A four is not even a tickle. I've been here with them and you hardly notice them. But that gives them a reason to do like an annual inspection. Just check everything and see how it's doing. Problem is our elevators are tied into it. So when the signal goes out, the elevators go, uh-oh. I don't want anybody in me right now. The dam's having a bad day. They just go down, open up, and work anymore. Being right here, it sucks. What do we do? Out the window's a horrible idea. <laughs> so all we got left is what we call stairway to We got bridge stairs on both sides. Um, we'll take you over to Nevada side, let you see Nevada. Nevada side from bottom to top, 717 steps. Almost straight up and down. I'm told from the power plant where we just came from the group our size, about 45 minutes to an hour to egress up. If nobody slipped and we all can come on down. You get, you, get a joke, you get the joke when you see it. It's pretty, pretty hairy. So. You guys want to head on that way. It should be a little cooler down there, too. You get the turn, just turn to your right. Yep. There's Greek and Roman architecture from how you do it. The plane of hardness decreases over time. In the next three minutes I will be showing landscapes around the Hoover Dam.
thanks for joining us on this amazing journey through the history of the engineering of the Hoover Dam. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you will never miss a new video. Drop a comment below with your thoughts or questions and let us know what other places or topics you would like to explore. See you next time.